So, buenos dia, uh, good morning to all. My name is Oscar Oliver Didier, and I'm here to introduce Why Architecture Think Tank. Uh, Why is a planetary studio that questions the political, historical, and material legacy and imperatives of the built and destroyed environment. Founded by Puerto Rican architect, artist, curator, educator, author, and theorist, Cruz Garcia, and French architect, artist, curator, educator, author, and poet, Natalie Frankowski, Why is one of several collaborative platforms of public engagement that include the Alternative Trade School Loud Readers, for which they just wrapped up a session this week at the University of Puerto Rico, and the Antidisciplinary Collective Post Novis. Now a team of three since Emma was born a year and a half ago. Uh, for me, Wise work provokes rather than resolve, re rehatches rather than invent, derives rather than copy. The projects and writings remind us that what is a tropical paradise for some is, his historical, is a historical site of exploitation and extraction for others. They are unforgiving in the relentless pursuit of making more evident that the Caribbean is the inaugural site of capitalist modernity sorry, and racial hierarchies. They are combative in their expressions while simultaneously poetic in their aesthetic experimentations. In this process, the post-colonial post is rehatched into emancipatory imaginations, what they call a post-colonial imaginary. Puerto Rico today, where I'm also from, is a site of unjust debt, vulture capitalism, and premature death. Garcia and Frankowski warn us that we are at the dawn of yet another round of inaugural models of human exploitation and land extraction. Puerto Rico and the broader global south as a testbed of late, late capitalism and a global necrofuture. In light of this, why proposes new post-colonial futurisms against and within the mantle of necropolitics. These new models of aesthetic and ideological iconography establish both historical and contemporary connections to anti-capitalist underground cultures. For example, the radicalism of early 20th century tobacco lectores or loud readers and the 2019 Perreo Combativo are constructively extracted from as speculative scenarios of utopianism in all its expressions, avant-garde, science fiction, and now as post-colonial imaginations. Garcia and Frankowski teach at Iowa State University where they are associate professors in design of critical futures and activism and emancipatory practice respectively. Their work has been part of exhibitions at Center Pompidou Metz, Noise Museum Nuremberg, the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology in Lisbon, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the inaugural Chicago Architecture Biennale, and the Venice Architecture Biennale. They are authors of a manual of anti-racist architecture education, narrative architecture, a clinical manifesto, pure hardcore icons, a manifesto on pure form and architecture, the upcoming book, Universal Principles of Architecture, 100 Archetypes, Methods, Conditions, Relationships, and Imaginaries, and co-editors of the Journal of Architectural Education issue on reparations, and an informa journal issue on networks of solidarity. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Emma Juizarix, Natalie Frankowski, and Cruz Garcia. So thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Um, we are, people say this all the time, but we're truly happy to be here, right? Uh, it's our third, third year teaching here. Uh, and the first time that we got the, the, like, an email from Andres saying, uh, you know, uh, we want you to, your work is really important for us in Colombia. We would like you to welcome you to teach here. We were like, Andres Haken knows who we are, first of all. That was the first question we asked. And the second one, we're like, are they really interested in what we are like, doing? And then after being here a couple of years and seeing being surrounded by really fantastic faculty and students that, uh, which we maintain a really like, uh, incredible relationship through the years, uh, then we understand what, 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 what he meant. So thank you very much. Uh, today's uh, exhibition, uh, sorry, uh, not the exhibition, it's a lecture. Uh, it's called Not a Test Lab, or No Somos Un Laboratorio de Pruebas, Loud Reading, Spirals, and Postcolonial Methods. Um, we're going to start with 
a couple of bibliographical notes uh, or what we call a conceptual, theoretical and practical project we call life, right? And how somehow everything we do is embedded between our life and practice. And when people say like, what do you do? It's, it becomes every time more difficult. But I would say like, uh, well, a way to summarize it is like question power. Uh, and that pretty much sums up uh, what, what we are about. So part one, history doesn't exist. There is no post or pre in this vision of history that is not linear or theological, but rather moves in cycles and spirals and sets out on a course without neglecting to return to the same point. The indigenous world does not conceive of history as linear. The past future is contained in the present. The regression or progression, the repetition or overcoming of the past is at play in each conjuncture and is dependent more on our acts than on our words. And this is a quote by uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui in Shihi Na Kah Uthiwa, a Reflection on Practices of Decolonization. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a bunch of images. Probably you shouldn't count them, right? Because uh, it's a lot. But you will see how the presentation itself is not really linear. We're going to start with something and end with something, and pretty much they are all the same. Some things may look like far away for some, at home for others, but they are all embedded in the same discourses, right? And uh, I want also to add that today we, you'll have two loud readers and also one loud reader, loud players. So. Emma and me will be the loud readers of, of this session and loud players too, I guess. <laughs> so uh, we are Natalie Frankowski and Cruz Garcia and Emma Yusarix, as Oscar mentioned. Uh, and, and this is really important even conceptually, right? Like uh, since our baby was born, we had the chance to, uh, at the call of uh, Leopold Lambert, to write a letter to her uh, for his issue on, uh, on, uh, on the land from settler colonial property to land back, uh, where we could explain to her the origins of her name, right? Emma from Emancipation and Luis Arix with the Taino Afrofuturist origins, right? Uh, this also allows us to think in the same way that you see the table with a, the bit of a mess that, that we try to create, right? In solidarity with Palestine, what's happening there, uh, and the ongoing struggle in Puerto Rico. Uh, all the images that we create, the construction of uh, images through archival material that is trying to tell a story that is not the story that we've been told, right? Understanding that history doesn't exist, that history are narratives constructed by the powerful and for those that have access to the means of production and reproduction, right? Uh, so that's something that is really important for us uh, in the way that we try to understand what is the legacy and the relationship between the systems of power and how story is narrated. We finish school, uh, I, this is a bit revealing about our age, but we finished school in 2008 in the midst of the financial crisis. This is us uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I, this is the last time I wore jeans. Um, we, were in, we were in and a suit, I had a jacket. I don't even know where, where, where that came from. It probably was my brother's. Uh, we were here in Brussels, uh, in the capital of Europe, wondering, how do we end up here in this practice that is exploiting our labor, not paying us, and we're doing all their projects, basically, right? Uh, we were like uh, saying to us, if we ever do architecture in a studio, we will never replicate this practice, right? We want to have something different. Uh, uh, this is a map of the first uh, 14, 15 years of our practice, right? I come from Rio Piedras in Puerto Rico, Natalie comes from Juan in France, born in Dundee in uh, Scotland. Uh, and in the first years of our life, we live in Brussels, we move to Amsterdam, Moved to Beijing, where we lived seven years, then moved to Taliesin, Taliesin West in Wisconsin, Lincoln, Pittsburgh, Blacksburg, New York, Ames, and so on and so forth. You get a bit of the idea. This is a map that we developed to try to understand our practice. So today's presentation relates really closely to this. Uh, it's the models of action, the places, the models of interest, the practices, way think tank here, Postnov is there, Intelligentsia Gallery there, loud readers somewhere, right? And how all these things are constantly in flow with each other, right? The mask is also a Behigante mask, which is, uh, you will see it if you Google it, if, uh, it's, a tra it's a traditional uh, um, uh, sort of artifact that is used in the festivals in Puerto Rico that connect not only to the colonial history with Spain, but also to the African heritage that is trying to kind of uh, address. 
again, we live in Beijing for seven years. Uh, so we went from living in a city of 20 million people, um, being in community in a really quick process of modernization. We used to live in Dongchurman. For those of you that are familiar with Beijing, we used to have a gallery in, uh, in, um, in Beijing Xiao. Uh, this is our apartment uh, in Dongyang Wang Hutong. Uh, and this pretty much summarizes our life when we were there, right? Uh, there was no space for nothing else than whatever you were doing at the moment, right? The production of stuff, of ideas, of manifestos, of uh, painting. We, before Emma, we used to have a couple of rabbits that live in the apartment with us. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, Yaki Panda. And then there was a uh, Blinky Pasha, Ponyo, and two chickens. One of them was called Chickpea, and the other one was called Doris, uh, uh, right? So it was uh, like life in its most intensity, right? We would do events at home too. Uh, uh, we used to run a gallery also, right? This is uh, Blinky and Pasha. Um, so we went from living in a city of 20 million people, right? To waking up the next morning in the middle of Wisconsin. <laughs> in what is now known as uh, Taliesin or the Frank Lloyd Wright whatever you call it. They changed the name like 20 times already. Uh, that's the barn where, that he built for his uncle, so that's where we stayed when we teach there. We went there to teach. So we woke up not only in the middle of the United States geographically, but also in the middle of the construction of the architectural genius of the white man that is going to save the world through architecture. Right? We had to deal with this history as we were teaching there. People were there just because they wanted to learn about Frank Lloyd Wright. So you can imagine when we came there, it's like, I don't care about Frank Lloyd Wright, how violent it got the first couple of months. Uh, however, we survived, unlike many people that lived there before. Um, there was a very intense uh, relationship with the history of the place, right? So what we wanted to do was challenge that idea of the, again, the singular author, the male genius that is going to transform the world, right? Through his genius, right? Uh, and what we wanted to do is create other forms of education within this place, right? Because we were there, and somehow we didn't have a ticket to go back to Beijing yet. Uh, uh, so we had the chance to work with our students in the production of new publications. Uh, remember this one, Andres happens to be in the cover, uh, with his work on, uh, on, um, on uh, IKEA disobedience. Uh, we, we asked the students, can you look at something else that is not Frank Lloyd Wright? Right? Can we look beyond the, con the constraints of this architectures that are around us, right? We work with high school students. Uh, our students did some magnificent thesis that didn't necessarily replicate what was there, but actually question it and so on, right? Uh, 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 and somehow I end up in this documentary with the most problematic title ever created. We're being critical of Frank Lloyd Wright, but BBC didn't care, and they call it Frank Lloyd Wright, the man who built America. So th there goes one year of work <laughs> down the drain. Uh, our, our educational practices are not only concerned with university students or with adults, but also we work a lot with children, uh, right? We believe that education of architecture, of the environment, of space, of ideas, is something that should be accessible, right, across generations. So we work not only with workshops in schools, but we make children's books or installations, right? Like this is one of our favorite projects ever, the Palace of Megaliths that we did in Shenyang. Um, maybe not the most sustainable project ever, but totally fun and totally worth it, right? Children were allowed or invited to perform the design of their environment for a couple of days. You, you should have seen the, the face of pure happiness and joy as they were like able to transform everything. Funny thing is that every time an adult went here, it would fr freeze in front of the blocks because they feel like, should I touch this or not? While well, the children are constantly transforming everything. While working with students, and this, I'm showing you this not only because it's a student project, but to see how teaching for us is such a central part of what we do. This in 2020, right? 2020 now is like a, one of those years, 1968, right? Like, <gasps> so much things happened in 2020. People lost family. Uh, people were marching in the streets, right? We were confined. We didn't know what was going to happen with the, with the rest of our lives, right? Uh, at the same time, you know, or earlier than this, we were teaching already a studio on the lectores on, or loud readers place in Puerto Rico. Students here already were asking questions about what does it mean to have an education of art about black emancipation, right? Or what does it mean to, to design for protest, 
right? Can we teach a faculty that, this, that learn, where people learn protests, to learn how to manifest publicly, right? Or where uh, people are researching about the role of surveillance in society. This all happening before the summer of 2020, right? So you can feel that there was already, uh, they were taking the polls of the time, right? Um, in the same way that Bad Bunny is gonna do later. Students thinking about what is the relationship to land reclamation, right? Uh, uh, to the production of land, all this in the setting of Puerto Rico, right? Uh, um, and, you know, later on here in Colombia with the first studio we taught of a great loud reading is in the making, but no one has noticed how the students use architecture not, not as a device to perpetuate the systems of power and oppression, but rather question the role of institutions in this. Institutions like MoMA, like the Met, or even Columbia University, right? In, the, in their own relationship with the neighboring uh, uh, Harlem. Uh, um, most recently, also some of our students make some incredible works. Like this one was very, uh, giving a preview about what's about to happen. What happened in the Met, he, Krita uh, Pizzu to Gomol, or Ted, he researched about the footprint of these artifacts from Cambodia that were stolen and they uh, helped finance the Khmer Rouge during the Cambodian genocide, right? Uh, and as he was researching this, Many the DA went into the Met like the world a month after he presented this and, and they confiscated the artifacts. So, right? so there was a very clear reading of the relationship of power and politics on that, right? Uh, for us, teaching is like another form of medium, right? Mediums that include publication, that include artifacts, that include a history of visual, of auditive, or of artifacts that are not necessarily modern or pre-modern, but rather they are all uh, in, embedded in time, right? That, that to us, it, that translates in the production of many, many different publications. Since the first zines that we published on our own when we were in Beijing and we had to ship it all around the world and it would be so costly and we were like, why are we making this? This makes no sense, right? But there was an urge to find a way to have a discourse that is, be, that is being exchanged to maybe later publications with publishers, uh, like uh, some of them that we introduced. The first exhibition we did in Beijing that was self-commissioned. We didn't even know if people were gonna come, right? That was uh, in 2010 or 11, if I recall. Uh, to more institutional exhibitions that allow us to present these ideas, like the first installation in the Chicago Architecture Biennale, uh, in the Cultural Center, or how this works develop into books, like the one we share with you of a narrative architecture, a clinical manifesto, right, that allow us to create a theory for a, pra a form of practice, right? Architecture not only as a way of using representation to sell a project, but actually to question the history and the legacy of ideology in architecture, right? This is a narrative architecture book where you have your, your, um, your reading of the post-colonial prose, right? Um, again, engaging with history through the form, the medium of, of the book, right? Uh, other projects like this, really all collage we made to investigate uh, a genealogy of ideal cities in architecture, right? By cutting and assembling a bunch of ideal urban plans that evolve in different forms of collages at different scales, right? We are trying to map the legacy of ideal urban thinking, right? Uh, starting with a show in the mat in Lisbon uh, that was uh, of modest size, I had to say. I don't know why this project keeps getting bigger and bigger, maybe because of urban ambition, to a second show we did in, during 2020 or 2021 in the, in the newest museum in Nuremberg, where the installation got much bigger, uh, uh, to the most recent one in uh, the Centre Pompidou Metz in France, where it, it, it was on the biggest hanging wall of a museum in Europe. So I don't know what are they gonna do next, maybe build the city? Um, it's a very beautiful exhibition. We have a chance to take part and also visit with our students and alone uh, on utopia and science fiction, right? And what was beautiful about it is how uh, different forms of futurism and literature and architecture were all embedded together. Uh, uh, it unfortunately, it's over since April, so you cannot see it anymore, but it lives in our memories. Uh, that's us with some of our students from Iowa State that we brought there. Uh, uh, and also, for example, uh, this book is coming in October, and it's a, it's a book 
uh, where a commercial publisher approached us with a simple, he, they have read the Manual of Anti-Racist Architecture Education, and they came up with an idea. We have an idea for you. Would you be interested? We have this series of universal principles of design, graphic design. Would you be interested to do one about architecture? And we came up with 100 principles, archetypes, methods, relationships that we tried to be, so you don't have to read Ching anymore or any of those uh, kind of generic theory books by Frampton and so on, right? Uh, where we actually put, we give, try to give the same value to things about uh, ecology or race or gender, disabilities, uh, like for example, a feminist city or a post-colonial architecture where we write 100 principles and make 100 images for each one of them, right? Uh, so uh, anybody that picks up a book that wants to learn about architecture is not only gonna learn about order and columns and symmetry, but also what does it mean to have an anti-racist planning or queer cartographies, right? Or uh, building construction moratorium or what are planetary architectures, right? That relates again to other books that we've done like the pure hardcore icons that try to explore uh, the role of form making in architecture and how power always understands form, but somehow we accuse of those that maybe don't have the same access to power to being informal, right? That's something that we hear a lot. Uh, and I was always interested, no, I want to have control of form too, right? A form that comes from below or from everywhere, right? A, a global majority of form, we'll say. Uh, for this book, we made a bunch of collages. We designed the book too, uh, and it was published first in English by Artifice Books on Architecture in London, uh, this is a long time ago, like 2013 or 14. Uh, um, that's the first appearance of my tattoo of the arm, as you can see. Uh, and most recently, and this is, we are really proud and happy, after many years, we wanted to make the first edition in Chinese and English, because we live in Beijing. And then the publisher in London told us, no, we don't do Chinese. So we were like disappointed. But with a friend, uh, Chen Hao, that is based in Shanghai, one of our longtime collaborators, kept insisting, and it got picked up by the biggest uh, publisher of, of books in China, which is China Building and Architecture Press. Uh, and they, uh, they thought, this book is gonna make us no money compared to all the codes books that we sell, so you can do whatever you want. It's not a, it's not a business project. Uh, so they also let us design the book, which we had to alter a bit because somebody had told us from the publisher that our graphic design looked like Chinese funerary aesthetics. So we, so we have to uh, kind of uh, adapt some things about the design of the project. Uh, we have shown this in an exhibition in 2014, uh, as you can see in a factory in Beijing, Beijing Design Week. It got translated to German also by Arch Plus for their 40th anniversary, that was a double issue. Uh, these things are like before anybody knows who we are, so it's like we get the work out there and it's like kind of anonymous in a way. Uh, uh, we have a chance to do a show in Berlin also with uh, Arch Plus. Um, and also the chance to translate some of those ideas into pavilions and other sorts of projects. Uh, um, this one, a poetry book we published in, uh, in Sevilla around 2015, uh, where we were exploring, again, language. It's like a, a post-colonial question of language. Is there a language that can be universal? I love when uh, Andres texted me about Raven Chacon's lecture. And I saw the lecture, and he said, you're gonna like this, and I really loved the lecture, seeing how he uses all these geometric forms to try to establish a different vocabulary that is not the colonial music vocabulary, right? So I think this relates to that, how we use words and forms as a form of exploration to performance, through form making, sometimes in paper, sometimes on spa in space. Uh, we were much younger here. Um, Again, all these forms and how they translate in three dimensions, in the museums, in the galleries. And how this translates to some failed project uh, that we were one of the finalists to design, one of the 10 finalists to design the largest museum in Europe. That happens to be in Moscow. Uh, it was a half a million square feet, 42, thousand square meters project between both of us, which is a big project. The idea, I'm not gonna talk about the project, but I want to say is that when we lost, we were competing against famous people like Aravena and Nieto Sobejano and so on. It was all politics at the end. We learned a lot. One of them is that if you don't have political power, sometimes it's a bit difficult to compete in these settings, right? Uh, when we finished, I was really sad when we went back to Beijing. 
uh, uh, because it was like, this is the like, only chance we're ever gonna get and we missed it. Uh, but the idea of having a museum that is open to the public informs something that became really important and that is gonna influence a later project. When we came back to Beijing, we started Intelligentsia Gallery. That was our anti-profit exhibition space, right? So here, if, even if artists sell work, there was no commission for the gallery. It was a completely non-commercial endeavor that became a really important art space in China at the moment, right? Uh, where the market was so strong, right? That there was no space for discourse necessarily. We would make exhibitions, like three exhibitions per month and sometimes 35 solo exhibitions in 35 days, which is a terrible idea if you want to sleep. Uh, especially if a performance artist wants to do a 24 hour performance in one of those 35 days. Uh, we would do all these exhibitions. There were mostly group shows with artists from all around the world, from Africa, Latin America, China, and so on, in a very small space. And later on, we can start getting invited to do exhibitions in larger spaces, in museums, in cultural centers, all with the same anti-capitalist program, right? Uh, um, as you can see in some of these pictures. Uh, it's a great piece of work, I say, do it, 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 right? <laughs> that is yes, 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 or right, right, right. Uh, they mean the same kind of, by a filmmaker, right? So all the artists, uh, Yuan Chi, that is a kind of known filmmaker, will work in different media, right? This, another anecdote that is quite funny, this got censored in another show. Because it's, it should be the little sticker that you put when you sell a painting, but somebody thought it was a Japanese flag, so they ban it. Uh, uh, some person banned it, right? They were like, Yu uh, uh, Bogong showing a work uh, from uh, Mongolia that says the dream is over, carved in marble, or Jason Mena that is a Puerto Rican artist based in Mexico City, working with the vocabularies of the underground market, right? Like good as gold is a phrase that comes up everywhere. At the same time, we were creating shows that were exploring things about time and history, or uh, I think like in a very uh, contemporary way, this exhibition about control and language called New New Speak, uh, um, that we showed in uh, around 2000, what? 2015, well, so many years already. Uh, um, Zero 010, celebrating the, the anniversary of the Zero 010 exhibition of uh, suprematism in art and non-objectivity non with artists from Russia, from Latin America, again, Africa, China. Uh, and maybe this, uh, the, the last part of this, uh, the last project of this first part, and this again connect to the last project we're gonna be showing, is a, a very important project of ours right now where we're building a house for one of our most important poets, uh, trans uh, poet called Roque Raquel Salas Rivera and using, uh, Roque was the, the, were the title of the Whitney show of the No in Puerto Rico post huracan. Uh, um, uh, we took uh, one of his books or the on the tertiary, right? The third thing that gives value among two things, that's a Marxist term. Uh, uh, but also we can think about gender when we think about the tertiary, a gender that is not bi in the binary, not male nor female. Uh, we also wanted to think in the architecture what happens when the house is a house for transitions, right? Uh, a house that is looking to the context, we work with the history of the place, uh, this ongoing, right? We are now start about to start construction at some point soon, uh, working with the materials of the place, but, and also to the geographies. But also what is interesting about the house, there's only two, two doors in the whole house that is the bathroom doors. Everything else is about transitioning from one space to the other, right? And we, we have these spaces that are, are the tertiary spaces that are not necessarily a room or a bedroom or anything, right? So it's a constant uh, circulation space um, for, for a very important friend of ours. And also somebody we admire, right? Uh, it's also a symbol for people that want to return to the island, but I won't get into the details. But what is important is that uh, you will see how working on other projects leads to this type of project, of architecture. Part two, critique de la raison post-coloniale. C'est pourquoi les analyses marxistes doivent être toujours légèrement distendues chaque fois qu'on aborde le problème colonial. Il n'y a pas jusqu'au concept de société pré-capitaliste, bien étudié par Marx, qui ne demanderait ici à être repensé. Right. Marxist analysis should always be slightly stretched every time we have to do with the, co uh, the colonial problem. Everything up to and including the very nature of pre-capitalist society, so well explained by Marx, 
must here be thought out again, right? This is a really important thing, right? Uh, we tend to over rely a lot on cultural analysis that comes from empire, right? And uh, oftentimes the perspective from the post-colonial world, if I want to call it, if we want to call it that, that way, uh, people are missing a great chance to understand what's happening by not looking into the colonies, right? Uh, this is a paper we wrote a couple of years ago. We have to say that we published Bad Bunny before the New York Times did, <laughs> just in case. Um, uh, when Avery Review invited us uh, on, to address something about land in an issue about empire and land, uh, we came with the idea of explaining what loud reading was. Loud reading was still a new project. I haven't mentioned it yet. I haven't explained it to you, but you will see soon what it is. But it consists on Loud reading, right, is a practice that starts in the tobacco factories in Puerto Rico. In the beginning of the, oh, actually starts in Cuba, but it spreads in the Caribbean. And it's very important in the tobacco factories in Puerto Rico. And it's because people are loud reading forms of political theory, right, to people. So they, uh, they help unionize, organize, ask for better rights, and so on. We wanted to understand what does it mean to loud read today. Puerto Rico has just ousted, right, like this flag that is here, is the black revolutionary flag in Puerto Rico, right? Uh, uh, Puerto Rico has just ousted for the first time a governor in this 500 year colonial history. Do you know Bad Bunny? Somebody knows Bad Bunny? Okay, this is Bad Bunny. This is before COVID, right? For us, Bad Bunny came from the future and he was in the center of the revolution, right? There was something about loud reading, right? These manifestos, and again, he says anti-patriarchal, Feminist, lesbian, trans, Caribbean, Latin American. I feel like that encompasses the manifestos that we need to follow today. Why? Right? Because trans discourse, anti-racist discourse, anti-colonial discourse addresses everything that is urgent. Everything to deal with the ecology, everything to deal with people. Right? This poem by Roque Raquel Salas Rivera explains quite well what happened with COVID even before it happened. He says here, hey gringo, if you love death so much, why don't you marry it? Here, 4,645, which is the unofficial death count of people in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, people that were not even counted. The government and media were saying that 13 people died for weeks, right? So when this number came out, it was not shocking to some, right? but it's a, it's a very brutal revelation of a system of oppression that dates back to the creation of the plantation. Who's this? And my students cannot answer because you know already. Who's this? How is she called? Colombia. Yes. That's Colombia. Bingo. Right? Who is she? Do you know this picture? What is happening here? Somebody wants to describe it? What do you see? <coughs> right. There's a white woman with a school book. There's technology. There's New York back here, right? There's agricultural technology that all these colonizers are bringing. Indigenous people are being pushed out into the darkness, far away from the light of God, right? Like that's the narrative of Colombia, right? That, are, you saying you, are you telling you this so you find another place to take a picture in your graduation, right? Because she, she is very problematic. Um, so what's the relationship of that to this, right? Black Lives Matter, the destruction of ecologies, right? White supremacy being completely unashamed, right? How do they intersect? What are the architectural, uh, how, how, what is the architecture, how architecture as an infrastructure help us understand this, right? Understanding that it's not only a thing about styles, right? Like this is some like ar neoclassical architecture, but that it also happens in modernist architecture, right? This is not a football celebration, right? This is the protest when uh, Jair Bolsonaro got kicked out by the voters of Brazil. We have on one hand the neoclassical architecture, and the other one, another form of architecture of power, right? We're really interested in understanding this. 
What is the relationship of the singular male author that is going to save the world through very clear answers like, yes, it's more. I have no idea what that means yet, and that was published like 20 years ago. Right? And working with people that hate indigenous people. I openly racist politicians like Jair Bolsonaro, right? Like saying like, all these indigenous people are staying in the middle of development, right? Like we should get rid of them like this, like cavalry did before. These are literal quotes from the newspapers, right? It is a shame that the Brazilian cavalry hasn't been as efficient as the Americans who exterminated the Indians. So what happens when we have architects defending these relationships, right? When we talk about ecology, we can never forget about people, right? The eco-fascist discourses that, yeah, this is the problem of the people that have created this. It's not all the people that created this, right? Many of us have been the subjugated in these processes. So what happens when architects propose to redesign Earth to stop climate change with his master planet? Or Vinny Mas proposing to cover the entire planet with an inhabitable biostructure. Isn't that what planet Earth already is? <laughs> I don't know if I should explain this anymore. <laughs> A couple of months ago, people can still defend him, but I don't know if that's possible today. Right? What is the relationship of extraction? You know, as Andres showed very beautifully in his project in Venice, of, uh, of extraction with politics, right? with architectures, of destruction. What is the role of labor in all of this? Right? These are the things that really concern us. Not only architects as a working force, but architects as part of a larger working force, right? Not as a white collar worker. Right? For us, it has always been a relationship of understanding what is the le legacy, right? And what are the things that, as Kusikanki affirms, are moving spirals. Right? These are pictures that are separated by 50 years, Baltimore in 1968 and Baltimore in 2020. And you can see that not much has changed. Where are our icons? Is it the singular male genius that is going to save the world? Right? If we have progress, you know, at least I don't have to lecture behind a bulletproof glass. And understanding what the postcolonial means to us. The postcolonial for us is not what happens after the colony. Right? We're not a colony anymore, we're good now. No. Puerto Rico has been a colony since 1493. I, I even forget the year. It's a lot, right? What happens, the postcolonial for us, with the hyphen in the middle, right? And this is against what the humanities used to define it. The postcolonial is what happens when the regimes of brutality, cruelty, extraction, capture and predation, precarity, austerity, that were the norm or are the norm in the plantation become the norm everywhere else. What happens when here is the colony? When you cannot run away anymore from hurricanes because they're not only affecting the Caribbean. When not only our people are dying in a hurricane without being counted, but millions are dying because of COVID, because of the same reasons. The world is post-colonial, right? Achille Bembe talks about the becoming black of the world. We call it the becoming Puerto Rico of the world. These are two news, right? We can see the relationship between these things, you know. The mass graves are not separated anymore. One is in New York, the other one is in the Amazon. Right? So again, what are our manifestos? What are the points we're trying to make? How do we learn from past struggles, you know, from the struggle in Vieques, from what's happening in Palestine right now? Right? Who are the people that are giving their lives, right, to protect our future? What is our role as architects? Where are we standing? Are we standing with private property? Or understanding that there's, uh, sometimes this is at, against dignified life or even access to having one, right? What happens when architects try to define architectures of oppression as designing for human rights and a must just world, right? Like this is literally taken from HLK's webpage, right? What are those architectures of separation? And what are the real implications? I mean, we all breathed this a couple of days, uh, weeks ago, right? The postcolonial is here, but who's protecting the world? What are the truly democratic forms of architecture? Right? I would say, like, this is very democratic in the way that the people are bringing down monuments that were never democratically erected, right? Monuments to fascists and racists and white supremacists. 
So where do we go from here? Can we have critical pedagogy, pedagogy as a form of activism, right? I have the chance to go on the streets, right, and talk about architecture to people that are not architecture students, right? But also in the way of transforming pedagogy as a practice of liberation, right? We used to teach professional practice class in Virginia Tech. And within the lecture series we have there, we have a lecture series that was called Activism as Practice, where we have architects, but also activists to come and talk to people, how they can make an, an artistic practice that is based center on activism, right? How do publications may allow us to address some of the inequities and inequalities of our discipline, right? The Manual of Anti-Racist Architecture Education that tries to question the legacy of modernist education, right? Again, with the singular male genius that is gonna transform the world, right? Like this, are, this is a transcription of the Bauhaus, what they, what they let women and men study, right? They couldn't do architecture nor anything that was in three dimensions because women, according to Gropius, couldn't think in three dimensions, so on and so forth, right? What happens when we have a legacy from that system of education? If anybody has done that cu white cube in first year, you've been learning about a white supremacist project that comes from Johannes Eaton, right? When he made the students in the Bauhaus design the house for the white man, right? Because formal purity, in this case, led to racial purity, and that led to eternal life. I don't know what he was smoking, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So even like Johannes Truby, uh, Stefan Truby's work on, uh, on right-wing spaces, what happens when right-wing spaces are the architecture school? What do we do with them? What happens, you know, we live in Iowa most of the year where most of our syllabus is illegal. So since two years ago, we started writing our syllabus like poetry. So nobody can blame us for what we're teaching. <laughs> right, this is real, it's not, I'm not speculating. People like are going after critical race theory, right? So we're trying to map this in the manual through this spiral of ecological justice, anti-colonialism, anti-racism, and try to intersect every form of knowledge through this, right? Uh, when we published this first free online, it was downloaded around 30,000 times in two weeks, which means that there was a real need for such a document, right? It didn't exist until 2020, right? We even talk about tuition fees. We're sitting in a very expensive place, right? What does it mean for the people of Harlem, for example, that they cannot study here, right? How do we map the history of architecture again in relationship to extraction, in relationship to occupation of the land? How do we turn this as a creative practice, right? Or artistic practice or architectural practice uh, in the construction and reading of all these landscapes of genocide of the Hudson River School? If you go to the Met, you will see them. And you will read a label that says, this, tr this painter went to Paris and trained and so and so, and he traveled to the West. And sometimes you will find a blue label written by an indigenous family saying, this is the murder of my family, right? This is what they're depicting, right? You have two contrasting narratives. One of them, official history. The other one, something questioning it, right? We take a lot of these images in order to construct what we call post-colonial rooms, right? This is the first installation we did in Nebraska where we ins insert militarized architectures in these empty landscapes to remind us about their violent past, right? As you can see in these images. We also co-founded uh, with a couple of former students and colleagues from different disciplines, Post Novis, right? A collective that learns from the tobacco factories in the Caribbean. We talk about it a bit already. But where tobacco workers were denied any means of formal education, they would pick one of their own that knew how to read, to read for them during the entire work day. At the beginning, it was classics what they were reading. But later on, the practice by people like uh, feminist anarcho-syndicalists and utopian author Luisa Capetillo would loud read not only Marx and Engels and Kropotkin and Bakunin to teach about communism and anarchism, but also her own utopian fictions of workers robbing a bank and living happily ever after in the countryside, eating delicious vegetarian meals, right? Uh, um, so she has helped foster a collective imagination, right? These are some of the members of our collective, uh, including the youngest one, Emma Juizarix, and a couple of professors and artists based all around the world, in Vienna, in the US, Puerto Rico. A couple of the post-colonial propaganda, like the one we're sharing here with the newspapers, and some of the first installations we have done, right, where we wanted to loud read this uh, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial syllabus in public, right? 
uh, always with tropical plants in, uh, in, in relationship to all these displaced natures, right? Um, these are a couple of us, loud reading manifestos. Other, other uh, lectures like this one that we did in Carnegie Mellon, we turned it into an installation of post -novice. Or even collective projects creating a play during COVID <laughs> in a 360 screen. It was very difficult to travel at the time, so we were figuring out ways to work hybridly. Collective publications like A Planetary Wretched, a post-colonial narrative architecture poetry book. <laughs> These are some of the acts of the play. When our students collaborate across different universities to make these post-colonial murals. Uh, these students from uh, Virginia Tech, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and um, Berkeley, right? Three land-grant universities addressing the land-grant footprint. Collaborating with artists, working with some of these questions in uh, exhibitions, like the Planetary Wretched, or more, more recently, Unpayable Debt, that we held in uh, Iowa State. Some of the propaganda to recruit people. And an installation we did last year, a great loud reading is in the making, but no one has noticed in Magazine in Vienna, where we turned one of the rooms into a flooded stage with the Caribbean motifs, and another one into a reading room for spreading anti-colonial propaganda. It's a loud reading event. And this relates to a platform, and this is an invitation to all of you, that we run since 2020, when in March we founded uh, in the need of providing free and accessible education at a moment where many universities were closing their doors to students, uh, create an, a platform online where we can offer lectures and workshops for everybody. All you need to do there is go online. We run a trade school. We have a couple of sessions, a couple of people here like Ivan, Andres, and some others that we're going to get also at some point, hopefully. Uh, uh, these are some of the speakers. There's an image there missing. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I don't know who's missing. Uh, but these are some of the speakers that we have, you know, people that you have here in lecture series too, uh, some of the faculty here too, uh, um, and some of the events, right, like uh, over 70 sessions already um, in the trade school, or what we call a trade school. Like you can do simple workshops like how to make a post-colonial landscape by taking a Columbus statue and decapitating it and throwing it in the lake. Uh, you can follow step by step. So we teach Photoshop to people. Yes, we, it's like Bob Ross but post-colonial. These are some of the sessions online. And what we wanted to do is to replace the canon of theory, right? For something that really is much more helpful for us, right? Thinkers that are really th helping us to think about the really important questions we are facing today, right? And most recently, just to wrap up, uh, we have the chance to run a pilot in person for the first time with the support of Mellon Foundation and Rearch Institute, where we run a program that was Afro and gay and queer and lesbian and trans and diasporic and Caribbean and Latin American, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal, collective, emancipatory, anti-ableist, and solidary, right? These are all words that came from the, from the event uh, and from the participation of people, where we had the chance to invite people from a really broad diaspora of Caribbean practices, right? I don't know if you noticed, but in Venice, it was supposed to be about the African diaspora and decolonization, and there was zero participants from the Caribbean, which for me is an insult, right? Like, we're the blueprint of the plantation. Uh, so, in honor to our absence from everything else, we decided to make everything about the hyper-presence of the Caribbean in the forms of making, in the forms of sharing. I mean, this is not planned parallel to that, but it's kind of funny that it takes place at the same time. Uh, not only we have participants from everywhere to, to offer lectures, that they also participated as students, but also we have students literally coming from everywhere, like uh, French Guyanese, uh, uh, young architect flying from Paris, or a, a Bolivian student living in Canada flying also to Puerto Rico, right? These are some of the participants of the program, uh, including Mark Raymond that flew 40 hours from uh, uh, Johannesburg to be there in San Juan. Uh, and what happened through the next 10 days through an installation that we collectively designed with Post Nobis, uh, um, we had the chance to create a model of an alternative 
accessible school that centers in the imaginaries of the Caribbean, right? Uh, um, we turn the uh, gallery space into a workshop, a library, and a space for world making. Right? These are some of them. So, as you know, the, the natures of the tropics are always taken out of context to make these still lives, right? We wanted to make a still life that it was political in the sense that we were addressing and controlling what it meant, right? So, uh, as uh, Julio Ramos explained in the last day, the, the tropical garden designed mostly by a German architect and, by, by, uh, and by, uh, with the idea of the Eurocentric form of knowledge that the University of Puerto Rico is, was transformed by a garden that was controlled with the discourses that are originated from the Caribbean, right? These are some of the images of the installation. Uh, and it started all with a series of mappings. For example, uh, we painted a, a blackboard where we could map the places of origin as well as our fields of action of in and interest, right? That was the first exercise where everybody's mapping where they come from and what are the fields of interest. This is gonna be part of a series of publications and a series of really incredible workshops like a participation as an anti-patriarchal pedagogy uh, that involves the body, right? Many different types of body, disabled, able, uh, uh, um, um, children, adults, um, different genders, non-binary people. Um, again, these are some of those uh, events. They are all led by, by the loud readers that are also students in each of the presentations. So it's a non-hierarchical space. I remember in Office Mice McDonald's doing Jeremy as president. And so for me, like... Right? And uh, having, for example, uh, Isabel Jolie Kerr joining us for IT or uh, Island City Lab from Kingston, Jamaica. And I love this because I think it's, it's, it really encompasses what many of us feel. Uh, being an architect in Haiti means taking place in a foreign dominated decision making spaces. It means taking up space, and I think here really importantly. It means taking or grabbing a seat at a table where you are often not invited, even though you are the main subject of the conversation, right? This is a super important quote from her presentation. What does it mean to practice architecture in Haiti, right? Uh, performances by uh, Studio L7 of Dominican Republic in the beach, some of the discussions, uh, an incredible project on translation but our, by our trans uh, poet Ra Roque Raquel Salas Rivera, a workshop on the history of the, the, the violent and, res and uh, history of resistance and occupation in Vieques by Maracani Olivieri, that is the only architect from Vieques that we know of, right? And something that she shared that is really heartbreaking is like out of her class of 14 or like 20 people in Vieques, eight of them have died of cancer already. And she's in her 30s. So, this, so you know, like we don't know all the histories, right? And this is really important. Even in Puerto Rico, the history of Vieques is kind of erased by the bigger island, right? And the bigger struggle and the, the like uh, struggles that go in the media. Uh, an incredible presentation by Jason Fitz, uh, Fitzroy Jeffers that is a Barbadian filmmaker that runs Third Horizon Film Festival. There is a film festival based on filmmakers from the Caribbean with the Caribbean as topic. Uh, and he presented five films he created from the, from the filmmakers of the Caribbean. And the following day, he presented this beautiful film uh, that, he pr that he directed called Papa Machete, about the machete martial arts in Haiti, like a secret practice of martial arts in Haiti. Beautiful. You can find it in Mimeo. We also, I think, like this, the the workshop that changed me the quickest. Nadia Huggins joined us from Saint Vincent, where she practices. Uh, and what is really incredible about her practice is that she documents Saint Vincent under the water. What is the importance of this? She can document climate change by the lack of life, you know, by seeing what is missing under the water, right? Documenting the people and everything. Uh, and we had not only the chance to listen to her 
unlearn about it, about how her amazing practice is so transformative, but also she taught us how to go on the water with a camera and look at the life there in front of us. And it took me like one minute to get in the water and then everything changed for me, right? Everything that I was missing uh, all my life, uh, I was able to see it, right? Just by going there with a waterproof camera, literally just one feet and seeing the life and how can that be transformed by everything we do down there, right? Mark Raymond gave us a beautiful presentation about uh, mapping, uh, Creole mapping, right? And the narratives that come from it. Uh, and Regner Ramos, uh, with his partner from Greece, uh, gave us this beautiful workshop on queer monuments uh, in, uh, based on the Colossal Sugar Factory in the west of Puerto Rico, right? That was a digital, it's a project that they're starting, uh, uh, but it was a beautiful workshop that was done digitally. Uh, our activist and writer, Yolanda Arroyo Pizarro, gave a fantastic talk and workshop on activism, le uh, lesbian, Afro-queer, Boricual activism, uh, through her work, uh, and, and referring to a poet of another Puerto Rican author, uh, started with uh, naming all the bod uh, women body parts that are named after men, and it was a lot. Um, uh, we have a, also a fantastic workshop on Afro diasporic mapping, learning about Bomba. <laughs> Right? So how all the storytelling in the Caribbean is also done through music, especially when everything else is illegal. Right? Uh, learning about the instruments and le learning about the legacy of these practices. And then in the last couple of days, in the weekend, we, we, can go, we, we went to one of the libraries founded by a very important Puerto Rican writer. That is one of the spaces of resistance where many of these li uh, literatures exist. Uh, and it's a really beautiful space. Uh, and the last day, the, the penultimate day, we went to Isabella to the west of Puerto Rico to do a collective polishing of risography workshop uh, uh, where all, many manifestos were produced as well as a writing workshop by Christopher Rey Perez that is also one of the members of our collective. And we wrap up with an incredible presentation about uh, uh, a Puerto Rican Afro, Puerto Rican activist Black Panther uh, 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 Sostre, uh, that is, uh, has a very important history in New York, in Buffalo, right? And we don't know about m much about him. And we're also publishing uh, um, a text, an essay by Julio Ramos that is one of our most important scholars and researchers on the topic. Uh, it was a beautiful wrapping up because it, it brought everything together from Capetillo to Sostre to loud readers uh, and in relationship to everything, right? Um, some of the publications that were produced uh, uh, collectively. And I want to close with this quote. The only purpose of education is to make new worlds collectively. This requires the practice of curiosity as a daily habit and the exercise of dignified and purposeful rebelliousness. Other worlds are possible. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, merci, for such a provocative talk. Um, Maybe the first question I wanted to ask is along the lines of the fact that your practice addresses this sort of post-colonial question about language that you mentioned. Um, a, new, a new architectural language based on performance, the spoken word, et cetera. But I'm curious to better understand how, how the role of landscape in your work, in your explorations regarding post-colonial imaginaries. How arguably they require the images and backdrops of colonial sites of exploitation and extraction. In fact, we saw multiple images regarding that. Um, and how you both visually intermix scenes of nature with illustrations of botanical classification in Bolero Tropical uh, and a narrative architecture, a clinical manifesto, your historic depictions of picturesque landscape serve as backdrop for your post colonial architectural imaginations. And again, this sort of imagery of manifest destiny also comes to mind. As we all know, and you alluded to in the Caribbean, the plantation machine 
impose a system of symbols as much as an instrument of economic production. Oh. Okay, I will. Okay, here we go. All right, let me rephrase that uh, question. Um, as we all know, in the Caribbean, the plantation machine imposed a system of symbols as much as an instrument of economic production and exploitation. And I'm somewhat quoting Jill Cassett here. This landscape was to be both the producer and the sign of imperial power as natural possession. Does your work intend to redefine this landscape or to make evident its colonial nature, or instead to have it become a mute or inert symbol? In a lot of instances, colonial backdrops appear serene and peaceful in your work? Has their imperialist capacity been vanquished or have colonial practices always <laughs> hidden their violent nature with aesthetic attributes? I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I think it, um, we use landscape, I think, in many different ways. And I think uh, the first one, as you mentioned, is the one where we question the uh, question it as a tool of representation uh, that was used in history, right? Because that was also like the, the way to, to be like a, a way of, of, of propaganda for the, the colonial um, uh, project. And what's interesting to us is like to, to always use it also as a way to contextualize all the, the different discourses that we want to address because it's a testimony of this history, right? And it's something also that is a bit forgotten because what's interesting when you deal with landscape is <laughs> you also have this um, idea of, of a sublime and uh, sometimes the violence and, and the, the context that is actually behind the, the landscape is not as visible as in other kind of depiction. So for us, it's really interesting to think about that. And of course, in, in different uh, types of work, if it's more like installation or collages, then the, the idea of, of reusing all the, the tropical uh, plants uh, specifically is also a way to kind of bring it back mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to the, the real um, context that is the, the Caribbean and kind of use it uh, uh, knowingly that you can use the, the um, you can reappropriate it, right? Because it has been um, taken away and used in, in a purely aesthetical uh, form and uh, used it, I mean, again, it's the testimony of all the, the also like the geographical uh, and historical deplacement of these plants too. So landscapes, could be people. Mm. And I think they, they tell you the history of the people. So it's also a way of, of for us to kind of, of unveiling that. Sorry. Yeah, it's also understanding the, every image is political, mm. right? It's mm. like, some of them are obviously propaganda and some of them are propaganda, but you don't notice. And I think that that's, that's where it lies. And in a way, uh, understanding the role that landscape Ideas about the construction of nature, the rela again, the rela as Natalie mentioned, the relationship to people. It's something that is really interesting. I remember being, you know, like many years ago, being in a lecture with landscape architects and, uh, and people work working with the Hudson River School paintings. And we asked a question about like the really problematic history of this and the politics behind it. And they told me that those paintings are not political. And I was like, but I mean, there's a painting about genocide and occupation. How are you telling me that it's not political, right? It doesn't have flags and it doesn't have like the tanks there, but everything we decide to not show in an image is a political decision, right? It's a decision about power. So in a way, that's what, that's what's really interesting to us. I, I also have to say that we made a lot of these installations outside of Puerto Rico and outside of the Caribbean and, the, and they, they have a meaning there. But once we did it in Puerto Rico, it acquired a different level of reading, like when Julio Ramos read in the, in the last day, he read like a full essay and basically the first part was talking about how us doing that garden there in the university was really challenging the image of the university that they wanted to construct as, as this idyllic tropical garden, right? Like uh, tropicality is a device of otherness, of disappearance, of occupation, right? Uh, we look at the Caribbean from a different point of view. We don't see it 
from the outside with the palms and everything. You look at it from the inside, right? So those images of pristine beaches and wilderness and horses and never people, and if the people are there, it's never like uh, uh, people in struggle or emancipated, right? Or in that struggle of emancipation, it tells you that there's a very direct control of the narrative. Again, like history doesn't exist. Whatever you're getting is a history that somebody's trying to tell you, right? A mostly a history about our place. That is not is not a place where uh, political people live, right? But more uh, a place for you to project, you know, whatever ex exotic aspirations, right? Bananas, you know, papayas. Uh, when you go to a supermarket, sometimes exotic fruits. Does that make me an exotic person, right? Uh, because these are this is our stuff. Um, uh, so landscapes work like that, right? And the history of landscape. We talk a lot with our students. You know, we go to see those paintings. And they, I mean, right now they're exploring the footprint, the colonial footprint of those images and artifacts. How, how do you go behind what is just there and the frame that, there's, that, that you're being shown and you delve deeper into the politics, right? And the footprint, the literal footprint, right? Like not only the footprint of the narrative, but also the violent footprint that allowed that painting to be produced also. Like uh, our next project after the book we're doing is, um, is, is we want to work on a book about ecology about measuring the colonial footprint of stuff. Because I feel like to talk about carbon footprint is really not enough, right? We're missing most of the picture when we talk about the, the historical violence uh, that goes, you know, in every scale from the planet scale to the, to the, to the body, right? Like to getting into, I think like working with, you know, with people that are talking about gender and, and, and race in such a deep and personal way, but also structural way. It's super fundamental to, to understand what, what, what we're trying to do. There's no, no separation between that and nature. And uh, Roque read a, a poem that talk about, I forget, Pan, Pana, Pane, uh, Pane, I think it's Pane, and it's about, there's a narrative about a snake in a tree, and somebody grabs the snake, this is a landscape, right, a landscape depiction, somebody grabs a snake, and, and carves a hole in the snake to make the gender in the snake, right? So there's a narrative about, about gender there in relationship to the landscape. We, 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 we saw last year when uh, C. Rylis Norton was here talking about the swamp, right? In relationship to race and gender again, right? There's, there's no separ separation between them. I feel like there's no people without landscape on the other way around, so, so uh, yeah. Uh, what we talk a lot about, like there's no uh, history, there's no ecology, there's no. <laughs> so it's always all connected. So to think that one is separated or one is uh, doesn't carry meaning or repercussion is is not understanding uh, the whole uh, image. Oh, sorry. So it's, uh, it's Emma's nap time, so she's like, she why am I doing a lecture again? <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump to Uriel, I can't help but think of this notion of landscape in Puerto Rico. And one thing is the landscape of, of the plantation and how that carried a very specific set of ideologies and economies. But now, under this sort of logic of, of, of real estate and, and, and you know, tourism. tourism and all these things, landscape is sort of refashioned in different terms, uh, but it still has this sort of colonial oh. underpinning. Mm. Uh, never uh, it just kind of refashions itself. Mm. Anyway, yeah. I, I always want to ask people like about white supremacy, about the plantation and all that. It's like, at what moment do we stop being a plantation? Mm. Can you point them to me? Well, thank you. Thank you for the amazing lecture. Every time I read your text or listen to your lectures, I I feel that I get a lot of learnings and challenging questions. So thank you for that. Um, I like very much the way you described okay. architecture in your lecture as an infrastructure that helps us to understand the world or that we have to question, to experiment, or as you said in your last uh, statement, to propose rebelliousness, to think of other worlds. Like this idea of uh, architecture's infrastructure to do all that. But when I try to, 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 to move that into a, um, uh, how can I say, to land it into a practice, to me there, there is one question that, that's on the table, and it's uh, the idea of urgency, right? So 
and many of the contexts you showed us are like crossed by urgent matters, no? Earthquakes, health and ecological crisis issues, whatever. But there's a big tension uh, when we go on urgency because urgency is also a device that, that is being used many times to frame the debate on urgent, supposed to be urgent topics, urgent yeah, matters, no? for example. No? And, and there's many decisions that are taken in the name of the commons for the good of or because of urgent context, whatever. So how do you deal with this idea of urgency well, maybe we need also a little bit of slowdown, no? And uh, also uh, being critiqued with these progressive uh, ways of understanding uh, time, uh, chronological linear time, progress in blah, blah, blah. All these things, maybe we need to slow down. Or maybe it's a matter of not believing it wa in what counts as urgent or amplifying what counts as, as urgent, because sometimes urgency is used, as far as I understand, I don't know if you agree, to hide other urgencies, right? So how do you deal with urgency in a context where sometimes are trying, uh, sometimes um, it is being used to frame yeah. the outcomes? So. Really uh, talking about the climate emergency means like uh, the first world is having uh, to deal with it, because there has been always a climate emergency for everybody else, right? And, but, but don't you think that in this idea of slowing down, yeah. to take the time to debate, to incorporate different voices, to learn from other ontologies, from other epistemologies, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe to do some other experiments, and there, there I go to the title of your lecture, where we're not a test lab, but maybe this idea of experiment, like for example in your, in your article when you were explaining um, uh, but Bunny's uh, context in these uh, strikes, I think that those strikes could also be understood as a little experiment, experiment of being together, of sensing together, of, of questioning together, right? So we are not a test lab, but, uh, but this uh, experimental dimension is also important, no? to, to this think, think these worlds in common in other ways. I think I like a lot your comment about uh, like going urgency uh, related to time too, because I feel like we can speak about that in many different topics, but a lot of them also that we, as you mentioned, become urgent. Sometimes it kind of depends who makes them urgent, right? Maybe the, the danger of making turning something into something urgent makes it a little bit more um, superficial that it is because I feel it's when we speak of, of uh, important debates that take place sometimes suddenly they become urgent but we, we don't see that they have been here f um, a long time in history because maybe the people who were talking about it were not you know looked looked at or like uh, had space to, to voice it and so I think that and I'm thinking of course like Naomi Klein speak a lot about you know the speed of capitalism and, and all this versus the speed of the people but what's interesting in her comment I feel is like the fact that capitalism or when you want to commodify something that could be a message right and I think we saw that a lot uh, post 2019 post 2020 when also when regarding all, that, all the protests that were happening in the street suddenly uh, institution wanted to, some institutions wanted to commodify it and it became something that was suddenly urgent but then the urgency of ap applying their method to it uh, meant that suddenly it became just like slogan, everything got kind of, you know, uh, simplified, uh, then the people who, who were um, uh, in the space to, to, to voice it were not the people that were already voicing it for, 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 for years, right, for, for a history. Mm -hmm. So I think when we think of, of, of urgency versus time and versus linear time, we also have to, to address that, uh, that we have to look, make the exercise, I think, to looking at a bigger uh, timeline and understanding really uh, that a lot of struggle have been struggles for, 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 for many years, right? And like, so I think as you were saying, like if it's versus, for me, like thinking of slowness versus urgency would be again, like who, who can carry the, the message, who has the voices and what are the method? And also knowing that the danger is like, you don't want to, to be superficial or to commodify uh, the answer. Sorry. <laughs>
right? Because uh, I think like international agencies or uh, or you know the government or you know the people that have to respond, like the organizations that need to respond to people's needs, they 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 are slow. You know, they they create bureaucratic systems that make everything impossibly slow. Uh, but then in a capitalist society, you're not allowed to be slow, mm. right? Because if you're not producing, and I always use this example, Haiti went from being the richest colony to being the poorest country. As soon as they lost, uh, as long as they emancipated themselves from Napoleon and the French, they lost what gave them value in a capitalist system, right? That was the free labor and the land to produce sugar, right? It was the biggest sugar producer. Uh, so in, in that context, I'm, I'm always arguing for like slowness. I mean, I'm not, not me personally because I, I live in fast forward, but you know, in, in as, a, as, a, as, a, as an argument, as a theory, as a way of living, slowness is anti-capitalist, right? But also you're not allowed to be slow because you die if you're slow in a capitalist society, right? Like you're, you're, you don't have any infrastructure provided in place. So what, what, I, what I wanted to bring to, that, to the question is a question, again, it's a, a relationship of power. Mm -hmm. Who is allowed to determine the time of something? And, and as, as long as we are kept away from that conversation, we're messed up because we're not controlling our time. Mm -hmm. right? Time is money. It's a, it's a kind of capitalist society uh, philosophy in a way. And, and in that way, you, you cannot even control, you know, I want to be slow, I want to live life, you know. I think COVID revealed that to, to many people in the way that they said, like, I don't, I'd rather do nothing than to spend my life working for like whatever, you know, is this minimum wage or like $20 an hour. Is your time really worth that? Mm -hmm. Is the urgency now urgent because it affects you while we've been suffering this for 500 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and in that way, on the other hand, there's things that are, you know, we're running out of time for many things too. Mm -hmm. uh, every time it's like, again, you know, like Palestina is getting bombed and people getting killed and, you know, Puerto Rico is getting privatized, you know, every day and so on. We can go and move around and talk about these, these things, right? Um, it, it is, it is, violence is fast and it's also slow. Mm -hmm. So like, how do we play, you know, with that and acknowledge that sort of um, system and knowing that I love, you know, when Kusikanki and Nikas Tess talk about time because, you know, it's like their time is not yeah. after Columbus, so it's not like modern time. You know, if you look at their time is much longer, right, it's a longer history. But at the same time, you know, our urgency is like, you know, when Maria Kenny presented, they say like eight of her classmates have died of cancer. It's like you need to take really quick measures. You need to take uranium out of there. I mean, you shouldn't have put it there in the first place, but it's real, like people are dying, right? So, so I feel like I would demand for people to be left alone, to be slow, but from the institutions and the em empire to dissolve quick, right? Move away as fast as you can. Like we don't have the time to wait for you to finish mm -hmm. right? whatever you're doing that is probably killing all of us. And, and I don't know. That's yeah. We need faster actions, but not, the action of them is not solving the problem it, because they are the problem. So if they are not getting out of the way, then it's, you see what I mean? Like, because I, it's like, I don't want another panel of European experts to tell us how we're going to save the Caribbean or the Amazon. You see what I mean? Uh, uh, we don't need that, but we need them to get out of the way quick and, and, and repair and return, right? Because it's almost like, you, you don't know how to manage yourself. Well, you leave a system of precarity and debt. How the hell am I gonna go burn myself with this? You know, it's impossible. Like, so there's no mechanisms of emancipation in place anywhere. Everything is always like, how can the colonial project and the plantation, right, transform, as you mentioned, and sh change form, right, basically. Just like become something that is, is not readable in the same way, but that operates exactly in the same way, through the fina financial, uh, financial ways, you know, and the social ways and the political ways. Mm -hmm. And maybe quickly before we, we jump over to the audience so they can ask some questions, I think that the, the 2019 uh, Puerto Rico, you know, yeah, protests to, to oust the governor were also key in sort of showcasing this tension between something that is very urgent. When you look at it in media, it seemed very urgent. People just went out to the streets and started doing all these sort of creative 
practices of protesting, but really they were products of probably decades long activism and groups, the Colectorio Feminista were doing work way before that. And a lot of the trajectories and organizations that led to the groups who organized the protest stemmed from the mutual aid, the folks who organized after uh, the 2017 And hurricane. many people are in prison yeah. still today, and, many, and, and not only them, even the generations prior, all the people that died and end up in prison, right? Because uh, you're basically challenging the biggest empire, military empire you've ever seen, uh, the world has ever seen. So, Yes, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a moment in time, but I would say it's like, it spans 500 years, right? Uh, that even if we don't know about the, if you, even if you don't know about the people struggling to emancipate you, it's still taking place, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like, again, like the narratives of how history is narrated, and I'm sure many of you can identify with this because of all the places where we come from. I think it's a really international audience where, you know, empire has a really large footprint, right? Uh, uh, and it's something that we need to like think about, as you say. Like there, there are struggles in the, our particular case in Puerto Rico that you can date, you know, to decades, but also you can date even longer, right? Because it, it keeps building. Capetillo being so so important, right? Or or, uh, or or even Sostre when it comes to that. And since New York is also so Puerto Rican, yeah. there is also this sort of beautiful trajectory of the lectores from the tobacco factories coming here and in doing New York. In the, in the factories and whatnot, doing the... Cap Capetillo used to run, uh, when she came here to organize, and this is like New York history, she used to run a, an apartment where she would rent rooms to the workers, but also she had a vegetarian restaurant that would serve meals. I love when I enter, people were eating here. I, I was like, that's the per perfect setting, right? Uh, Capetillo used to uh, make, she had a restaurant that apparently was delicious because uh, some, some, some chronic, uh, some, some history uh, documents say that of all the workers said that it was delicious food, but she would serve them food even if they didn't have any money, right? In the, sp in the spirit of mutual aid, right? In the spirit of sharing and, and solidarity. Um, that was not, it was not based on the, the, like, uh, the place where they come from or anything, but rather like in their struggle, right? To be emancipated as workers. All right, so maybe we go over to the audience. Hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I'll just jump straight to my question. My question is, how does treating historically significant architecture as a form of ideology and uh, exploring utopian, heroic, and uh, critical projects contribute to a, like, a broader understanding of uh, urban critique? And how does it articulate the aspirations and potential impact of post-colonial uh, imaginary in, in a world that is, you know, like marked by abrupt interruptions of solidarity networks? That's a great question. I, I, in, in previous lectures, like Natalia and me, we always have this uh, quote that is by Deleuze, actually, that says, since each of us was several, we were already quite a crowd and I like that not of, of us as two people and now three, but us, that when you understand that history that is, that is being hidden from you, you understand that you're not alone in the struggle, right? And when we think about emancipatory struggles, you know, like feminist struggles, trans struggles, queer struggles, like anti-racist struggles, anti-colonial struggles, that's why they don't want, that's why they're getting banned in school, right? Because they teach you how powerful you are in history then you may feel emancipated, right? And say that demand for better, right? So that's why it's, it, that you understand uh, how this infiltrates politics, because politicians understand it quite well. And this is policy, I was discussing with a friend, uh, actually with one of your professors, with Justin Garrett Moore the, the other day. There's think tanks in the US that work on policy making like decades ahead of time. Like where they've been thinking, when is the ideal moment to ban these books, right? So when the moment is ripe, when we have the right politicians, we're gonna ban them. Because that's the history that they're trying to take away. Because as soon as you understand that utopian is not a European's dream of a bunch of dudes in Florence or, or uh, you know, uh, some dream of uh, racial superiority, but also that they're utopian dreams of collective emancipation, right, and a post-colonial world, then you may know that you're not alone, right? That we need to have a, like, 
planetary solidarity, right? That is really important to know what is happening in Palestine. That is really important to know what is happening in Bolivia. That is really important to know what is happening in Pakistan and in India and in China and everywhere, right? And I feel like that form of understanding and for us the, the research on, on, on what form do th those things take? What is the propaganda being produced, right? Like what is the paraphernalia that is being shared? And how can we reclaim that, right? In a way, when you feel like you're alone, you know, early in your career, you realize that you're not alone because a bunch of people have been doing this and are doing this, right? So it helps you connect the dots. And I think like on one hand, that's, that's the importance of theory, right? Theory on one hand gives us vocabulary to address really important things, right? Like that's why critical race theory is being banned, right? Because uh, that's the power of theory. And in the other one is the, the importance not of history, since history doesn't exist. And something I repeated a lot in Loud Readers is that time is a colonial construct, right? And time as we know it. But to understand that there are many things that are connected, right? And in order to understand that, we need to know about them. And we need to learn how to look for them. And sometimes we're going to find them in books. But sometimes books are also going to be lying to us, right? Uh, when we wrote the letter to our daughter, her name, we say, we wrote to her that her name, sh we, we gave her her name so she can use it as a map to trace her ancestral origins. Because maybe the university is going to lie to her. And for sure the museum is going to lie to her, right? So the institutions that are uh, here to bring us the truth are not, right? You go to the university, if you want to learn about black studies or everything that is not white, you have to go to gender studies or Afro, but everything else is assumed to be universal, but it's not, right? It's a very European, uh, white, uh, male, uh, straight, cis, you know, uh, form of knowledge what is, what is being given to you. So probably you're not gonna find those struggles of emancipation and the connection between those things there, unless you have like particular people you can go to, a new department that was formed that is not funded by the central thing, right? Because it's not, it's not doing that. So how can we, how can we map those cartographies, right? Non-colonial, anti-colonial cartographies. Uh, and how can we use them? I feel like I see them as tools also. We see them as tools. When lo we're looking at history and understanding, you know, what workers were fighting or, you know, how we can learn from, uh, from Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, right? Uh, because everything gets a whitewash in history, right? Like it was Pride Month and all the, all the brands, even brands that will actually, you know, fund politicians that are trying to kill trans people will like put a, put a rainbow flag. And that's a history they want to tell you. It's not the history of the activism that you need to know, right? The history of uh, anti-colonial struggles and all the people within those struggles that are even more oppressed than others, right? That are getting crushed by the military forces, right? So I feel like there's, there's a lot of history that we need to be aware of. So we need to do our homework. And once we start doing that, then we realize that we're not alone. And that's why the importance, you know, a collage for us it's a super political tool, right? Because it's literally taking all this historical baggage and just throwing it there visible so you don't forget, right? Every single thing in that image, in those images, in those collages, are things that we are looking at. And there's a little poster, you know, of a, of a, of a farmer's struggle somewhere, right? Or uh, a little book in the table that is a book about emancipatory pedagogies, right? Uh, um, and, and, and yeah, I, I don't know if I'm like answering the, 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 the question in the totality, but um, that, that's why we can expect of an emancipatory education, right? And, and we are at the center of that as we participate as political agents, right? Of change collectively, right? For, 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 for planetary questions that need really urgent answers that we don't have all the time in the world to, 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 um, to address. Um, Sorry, Natalie's hidden there somewhere in case you don't see her. Because Emma is, um, Emma is climbing, is in the climbing hour. We, we can start here, but I think otherwise there's someone else in the back. Okay, but we can start here and then maybe, okay. Uh, no, just to your question, why to make it political? Why not to make something for all the people to come together for a good cause versus going to a Palestinian issue that's existing for many years and there are two sides for the story? The, sorry, I, I didn't understand. The question is why not, why bring the politics to architecture? 
There are conflicts that have two sides, just like the Palestinian issue that exists for many years. So why, why make architects and architecture involved in politics? Well, architecture is always involved in politics. Architecture is political by default, right? And I'm gonna use the Caribbean as, a, as an example. What is the first thing that people do when they go and, make, uh, and, 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 and colonize the Caribbean? Make planning laws, right? So you can divide the thing in a plantation, build some buildings, administer the ground. Architecture is by default, by its very definition, a political act, right? You're deciding as power, I'm gonna build here, right? And you decide what you do with the people or with the landscapes that are there, right? So I would say that there are many sides to many different stories, but there's also stories of occupation, right? Where some people are disenfranchised, right? Where people are uh, abused by military powers. So, you know, I, I show the, the example of Vieques, right? But also we can look at Palestina, right? Like, the, the, you know, Eliel Weisman writes about it. This is not, a, this is not necessarily a mystery and, it, and it's not uh, like, yeah, you know, I, I have a problem with the, there's two sides of the argument because usually two sides mean that there's one that has more military power and there's one that has less, but I had to listen to, to the one that has the most power, militarily speaking, right? It's the same that they say to us, you know, like, yes, you know, you have to listen what the US military has to say about Vieques. Should I, right? Or should I worry a lot about what uh, Spain did in Puerto Rico for 400 years, right? I'm sure they had a reason to do that. Probably their food was bad and they needed spices, right, to cook. So you can get some spices there. You can get sugar, you can get tobacco, right, to smoke, everything that is pleasurable, right? But that doesn't mean that the voices that we haven't heard of the people that are being oppressed are really urgent and important, right? And I feel like when it comes to relationships of power, uh, and, and you know, again, like saying that architecture is not political is a political act, right? We're deciding to overlook all the zoning policies, all the economic policies, all the, you know, military uh, occupation that it, it needs to take place, you know, in, in the whole continent of the Americas. Without military, there's no architecture, right? Because nobody's gonna enter in somebody's land and say like, hey, you know, I'm gonna build this city here that looks like Spain or like Portugal or like France or like Denmark, and you're gonna agree to it, right? And you're gonna build it for me also, right? And then you're gonna be my property, and your children are gonna be my property. And whenever you're not my property anymore, you're gonna owe me money, right? That's pretty much our history here, right? So, yeah, I mean, we can listen to both, both sides, but the other side, I've been listening to it in every single history book until now, you see? Like, and, and th that's why like, that thing about the both sides, uh, if one of them has a big military, maybe I already listened to that story. And, and I feel like we, it doesn't matter where we come from, and especially if we come from those places, we need to do the effort, right? And we need to be uncomfortable, because it's not easy, right? It's not easy to be in the position like, man, Maybe I'm part of the problem. Maybe, you know, we should figure out different ways to, to deal with this. Maybe I should understand what are, what are the uh, oppressed of the world struggling with. Because it affects everybody. This is uncontainable. You can contain it for so long, right? It always spills. It always spills in violence. It always spills in genocide. It always spills in ecocide, right? So, so I feel like it is, I, I'm just more launching an invitation right, where we, um, where we try to understand the subaltern, right? And again, there's a whole body of knowledge. This university hires some really good thinkers on the subaltern world, right? Um, because they have money. That is connected to the plantations, but still, you still, some universities have the money and don't have the faculty, I have to say. Uh, 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 but in that regard, yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm unapologetically asking, begging people to please try to position yourself on the, on the oppressed, right? Uh, the people that have their guns don't need help, right? They don't need that much scholarship, right? Uh, um, my dream of a university is that there's a white studies department. 
right? In the same way that there's uh, Southeast Asian studies, black studies, gender studies, white studies, right? To study what are the implications of white supremacy, of settler colonialism, and all the things that are embedded to that, you know, capitalism in, in all that, like, you know, heteropatriarchy, uh, um, and how, 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 how can we dismantle it, right? Um, so in, in, that, in that way, I wouldn't ask, you know, there's both sides to that. Of course there's both sides to that, right? Uh, but I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, it's just like a whole body of scholarship on, 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 on the two sides question, um, which happens also in the US, right? Like there's a side also on the side of the police or the side of the military. Um, uh, they have the guns. I just want to have the books that emancipate me. Thank you very much for uh, spreading uh, awareness in regards to the post-colonial situation um, within the framework of ne necropolitics. I wanted to say public defecation and vulgarity, as, you, as you've mentioned, are tools of kinesism, and they challenge idealist arrogance in the public space. Um, for instance, the, the globe javelin, telescopic towers, and other works you've mentioned are forms of surreal, defensive, and uh, invasive architecture similar to the continuous monument drawing by Super Studio, but currently projects such as Neom are testing grounds for sci-fi and av avant-garde uh, architecture. And your work on uh, entitled Landscape Without Qualities is also your manifesto that reveals the dullness of vulgar shapes and pristine landscapes. But I wanted to uh, maybe uh, pose something. C can you say something about the direction our world is taking? in regards to the built environment by way of materializing these pseudo futuristic uh, shapes in the landscape and their impacts, for instance, in relation to the recent protests in the Bon Lieu of Paris and, uh, and, and other uh, Arab uprising and all the continuous 50, 60 year uh, history of our world. Maybe, how would you say that? How would you say it? they would create these as well? Do you mean the architectures that are being built, you mean? No, th for instance, the architecture of Neom and mega projects and these large interventions of sovereign states. Neom is the uh, continuous monument. Yeah, it, is, the, it is exactly the continuous monument. So yeah. I'm going to be careful with that because uh, what I feel is like Neom gets a lot of bashing because it's not in Europe or the US. You see what I mean? Like, and that's why we want to do the book on the colonial footprint of architecture. Right? When I look at the colonial footprint of a country like the US, or let's say France, since Natalie's here, uh, the devastation is such a, at a colossal scale. Like, who is the biggest polluter in the world? The single largest polluter. Somebody knows the answer to this. The US Army. Who's the largest client of, the BP, of BP? or whatever they're called now. They changed the name, no? Whatever, they morph into another monster, the Kraken. Uh, who's the largest client of, the, of BP? The US military. <laughs> Who is the largest emitter of CO2 emissions? The US military, right? So, going to architecture and, and mega monuments. Neon may be problematic still nowhere close to the US military, right? So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in the media when they focus on a project, right? And of course, you know, it's usually the shady, you know, the Archangels and the other guy, like I, I won't defend it because it's like, just by looking at the list of people they invite, it's pretty awful, you can tell, right? But the alarming, you know, the urgency that media puts into addressing Neom is a bit ridiculous compared to the footprint of the US military, for example, right? So why are we not talking about the US military? But we're talking about Neon, right? And the, the same we can do, you know, when China was building a Three Gorges Dam or whatever, it's like, oh my God, Chinese are building a huge railway system and they're, they're displacing people. Yeah, I mean, like, there's some negatives to that. But also, you can look at the footprint of what is coming with it, right, in the sense of like a public transportation or water for communities or whatever, versus the US military that only brings 
chaos and destruction, right? So I can, when, I, when we measure the colonial footprints of places and their institutions, those things cannot be overlooked. And the fact that we don't have a way to measure that, it makes it really difficult to assess the real implications of things, right? Because then we may get lost discussing a project that is big and maybe problematic, probably ecologically problematic, you know, I'm sure there's politics there that are messed up, I'm not denying that, but for us to spend all the attention looking at a, basically an ego project, right, of a politician, like many others, uh, and ignoring the biggest polluter in the world that happens to be the US military, I feel we're not doing our homework, right? And that's architecture, right? Because uh, the biggest contractors, the biggest contracts in the US are through the US Department of Defense. Ersela Kripa last year lectured about like the whole infrastructure of, of the border, you know, and the village, the, the building, ecologies that are being displaced, and the global scale. Now, they don't have a funky architecture like Super Studio, right? So maybe architectural wise, because it doesn't have the aesthetics that register to us, we don't pay attention to them, still architecture, right? Still destruction, still the footprint is humongous. Now, I will say, maybe Neom shouldn't be built, right? But if I make a list of things that are urgent, it wouldn't make the top 20, I can assure you that, right? Uh, 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 I feel like we got to, and that's why we have to talk about politics and not separate them. Because it gives us the illusion that what Valery Orgiati, if any, any of you know, when he published non-referential architecture or looking at buildings in their details and their corners, I mean, yeah, maybe you may like a corner. Do you need 40 publications about that corner? Yeah. Right? Do you need all the grants and, and, and fellowships to go to the people researching the corner? Probably not, right? Like there's, if, if, we, if we say that we have really urgent issues that we need to address, we need to think about them. And we need to name them about why they are, right? There's literally destruction and occupation taking place. Uh, the, I, always, I always say the wrong order. It's the I, International Panel for Climate Change. It's IPCC, I always say ICPP for whatever reason. Maybe it sounds funnier. Uh, after the sixth report, I think they've been doing 30 years, for, finally they address colonialism as a cause of climate change, right? If we're not addressing those things, and maybe Neom, that's the, now, like, when we go in the intersection of colonialism, right, and Neom, that's when it gets interesting. Not so much about the ego project, but about the land being occupied, about the ecologies being destroyed, and so on, right? But, but again, it's not alone. It's not the only one. There's an endless list that starts with the US military. Oh, so yeah. I don't know if some, some of you have uh, followed mama, that, but mama, um, mama. so we have in France, mama. there's a lot of, mama. 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 sorry, <laughs> Attends, mon coeur, tiens. Oui. tiens, tu vas aller avec papa un petit peu, okay, sorry, I'll be back, oh. okay, we'll try, we'll try again. <laughs> sorry, so I don't know if, if some of you followed what was happening in France, but, uh, uh, we so a, a young uh, a guy called Nael, uh, he was 17 years old and he got shot by a police officer uh, during a, um, a control uh, because he many different things, he got scared, uh, the police scared him and they just shot him. Following, the, following this, uh, there's a lot of, of protests happening right in, in France, so they are burning also like cars. So it, yeah and also like, uh, like burning buildings and things like this. So, of course, this is a direct protest to, to the assassination of Nael, um, and we are standing for that because uh, there's no reason for, for police violence ever. Uh, but also it's a very architectural uh, respo uh, response to, to, as we were saying, many years of, of like oppression, Lack of disenfranchisement, lack of investment in 
the French banlieue, so the banlieue is the, the projects right, that we have in France, lack of money that has been put. All this is a problem that we know. It's very, again, like I, I say very architectural because if you go to the banlieues in France, you will see, so it's like, so it, they were built in the 60s, uh, at the time post-war, also when France wanted to, like, to build more, uh, welcome like a lot of people too that were uh, also from the, the old France colonies, uh, didn't really provide any good infrastructure to link the banlieue to the cities. Uh, pushed the banlieue far away from cities, then didn't invest money anymore in them. So the lack of infrastructure, services, schools, uh, they are just really um, like separated from, from, for example, if you look uh, at Paris from the, from the center of Paris, like they are falling into pieces. There's no, there's no um, money put into like parks, like areas for, for people to live correctly there. So what's happening now is also like a, a bigger uh, protest against the fact that France is, is, is divided because again, there was like a lack of, of, of money and involvement to solve how people live and how we, we created uh, places where people cannot live in a dignified way. Um, and also the fact that France needs to address uh, the colonial past, and that's like a, something that is really, really problematic in France, is the lack of discourse uh, about that too. And, and it's almost like if Neom was a big social housing project that it was gonna have all the luxuries for people, right? But it's never that way. And I think that's, that's what the problem, more than it's, you know, in Saudi Arabia or it's like, a, you know, the ego project, is that architecture is, mostly a tool for consolidating power and wealth, right? We can see it in New York, you know, here is like very evident and, and real. Go to Hudson Yards. Like, uh, like two weeks ago, we learned Hudson Yards is funded through an exception of visa that connects them to Harlem, mm -hmm. right? And it shows you how like disgusting this system of capitalism is in a way. Uh, uh, so the question of the, of the, you know, of the, of the artifacts and the, I think it's, uh, at the end it's about the program and who, what is serving, right? Uh, not particularly worse, but terrible in that way. Is there maybe one more last quick question? So uh, throughout uh, the, the work, we see the use of uh, pure forms and geometries, and architecture or non-architectural work. Um, and pure forms are closely related to Western civilization, pl platonic ideals and platonic forms and so on so, and so forth. Uh, I would say, how, how, would you, how do you reconcile that? Like, if, if there's a perfect sphere, is there like a perfect image of a man, a perfect race, a perfect civilization? Yeah, it's a good question. Can I and jump into this? Yes. To, to, to yes. Uh, because I wanted to make another qu uh, question that is very linked to this, so uh, can we connect this question with the idea of uh, fetish? Uh, because uh, but the which fetish, the Marx one or the other one? Exactly. So in in its in its in all its sense, he was going to say double, but there's more than two senses. No, like um, understanding this this idea of using these uh, images as icons, fetishes in your collages. Um, Understanding them, of course, as images, uh, the, the idea of a fetish as something that hides all those socio-ecological, economical processes, blah, blah, blah. Of course, that's, that's very evident that you're doing that. But and, and I perceive, and this is an intuition, that your use of these pure forms are also working with kind of representations that do not represent something literally. So it's kind of, there are empty representations in the good way of emptiness, uh, meaning that at least this is what they do to me. They make me since there are representations that do not have a referent, that referent can be imagined. So it allows me to imagine other worlds. So it, 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 it insectivates my curiosity, using your last quote, no? Uh, it makes me try to think of those other possible worlds, no? So what about that? Y yes, uh, uh. And, uh, and after I'll, I'll go with Emma, but on, on that also what was really interesting for us when we were dealing with the idea of like these, these shapes and like is so it's very complex and I would say a very problematic word, but the idea of universalism, yeah. because of course there's like the univers universalism that is imposed, right? That just wants also to flatten ev everyone's history, everyone's identity. 
but what we were curious about, and it would be a universalism, universalism more driven through language and for possibility of, of that, right? Of, mm -hmm. like, of reappropriation, mm -hmm. um, communicating uh, as a collective, right? Or as a community. So it's something that we, we explored more through art because also we always try to divide a little bit our art practice from our architecture practice because we always feel that architecture should always be very responsible, right? We have a responsibility, we, what, and we, we talked about that. Whatever is, there's a lot of, you can define architecture. I'm sure we can take like a full day to, to try to define what architecture is. It can be many things, but it has, it has repercussion on others than others, than us. For us, art is a little bit more freeing in a way that you can, you know, you are free to take what you see or what you experience in art as you want. Like if, it, of course, like, like different types of art, right? There's some that, that can be like more intrusive than others, but we were just interested in that. So in our art practice, like what, what can we do to try to find something of the common, right? Or something that we can all exchange with. And that's why thinking of language for us, forms and pure shapes are a form of language, form of poetry. We write poetry with shapes. So it was a, a way also to try to, 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 to create this space for the, for the common. But, but also like going back, I think connecting both, something that we've been, like the first time we, when we published Pure Hardcore Icons, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's kind of trying to understand how power uses form, like historically, you know, like mm -hmm. in Egypt, you know, in, in the kingdom of Kush, they understood the power of form but also people understand the power of form today, right? Like there's, there's a, like a real political program in form making, especially pure form, mm -hmm. uh, but also as a form of language, as, as Natalie mentioned, we're really interested in like also how uh, like the revolution has formed too. We know what the black flags are in a certain given context, you know, I'm wearing this spiral here, not, not as a coincidence, right? But, the spiral as a form, but we made the diagram of the of the spiral against the circle, right? Like the spiral allowing for growth, also being a way of thinking about time that is non-linear. Uh, I feel like there's forms are again like empty of meaning depending on the context, right? People project their meaning there, but also they are very human. I feel like we are form makers, and I was again interested in the if we subaltern or the oppressed or the majority of the world, whatever you want to call it. I, I'm reconsidering even the third world uh, concept because uh, Jason Fitzroy uh, Jeffers, he talked about like how the third world is not the third, you know, in the sense of scale or importance, but rather third as non aligned, unaligned in the two, in the two battles between the empire. So in a way, even the like third world form or third form, you know, in the way that um, I hate being called informal, right? We know what informal means, right? Informal means, an informal settlement means that you haven't been able to read the form of that or you haven't allowed me to make the forms that I want, right? So in a way, it's like a claiming over the form. So it's not only empire and the powerful that have control over it, right? Uh, uh, look at it as a form of language that is human. Mm -hmm that we always have made that. And, and the more you research, the more you find like people have been doing this since forever, right? It's something that, that unify mm -hmm. us. So uh, in a way also it was, when we made those collages, the early ones, you know, about the pure, pure hardcore icons, it was a way to demystify the icons. I remember, you know, even lecturing in China and somebody asking in the stage, oh, that's a Western thing. So you're telling me that pyramids are Western? You've been lied to by your history class, right? Uh, uh, or spheres are like a construction of, uh, of, uh, of Plato. Like, of course not, right? Uh, uh, so how can we educate us with that? Understand that we are form makers and that we are powerful enough as peoples to control the forms we give to everything, right? So, so I, I, I would look at it like that, you know, and, and that has be, become more evident with the years. At the beginning, we didn't know necessarily what we were doing it. It's like I'm drawn to it and research it because you see that it's prevalent everywhere. Uh, and then you read Carl Jung, and then you read other people, and they give you certain readings into it, but then you realize that it's not even for them to, to, to answer, right? That it has been uh, even our own ancestral and futurist forms of knowledge. So in a way also it's a, something about 
against the new, right? The idea of the new, because we were saying that the, the shapes are, could be universal forms, right? Could be universal. They, they are found out through history, through different um, many, uh, also different to users, people in art, in construction, in clothing, in artifacts. So, and it's also something because the new, right? The, the idea of the new and the new in, in many things, but the new also in architecture is something that is very. Uh, colonial when you think about it, because it's the idea that you know what was be behind be before, sorry, doesn't count. We need something new, and the idea also that we can create new is yeah, also like a fiction, right? Because but because nothing is new. We always uh, there was always traces of something. We we re reassemble, we re reuse it, so it's something we different. Occupy. Right? We occupy. We also it's occupy and, it's and erase right. the histories that were there, right? So that's also part of that. It's like injecting history, but also understanding the role and its potentialities, right? Like as, uh, as Uriel was mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, there are forms of hope and revolution also and emancipation, mm -hmm. right? But also there's forms of occupation and they may be the same form, which is also uh, where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. So we are unfortunately out of time, but uh, thank you so much to Uriel, Natalie, Cruz, and mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.